Formula One power units are the most efficient internal combustion engines ever built. Hi, I'm Lake, the motor oil geek, and at over 50% thermal efficiency, Formula One engines use the science of tribology to extract every ounce of power from the engine. And when it comes to the motor oil itself, we're not talking just about friction, we're also talking about combustion. That's right. Formula One engines use oil as fuel. Now to be fair, the amount of oil being burned as fuel today is minuscule compared to what it was several years ago. Since the 2014 season, Formula One has used what's called the power unit. It's a 1.6 liter V6 that is turbocharged and hybridized. Of course, one of the coolest things about the engine is that even the turbocharger itself is hybridized. I'll leave a link in the description box below for some really great videos about Formula One power unit, just in case you're curious. One of the things that came about during this era with this engine was the burning of oil as fuel. And the reason for that is that these current engines have a fuel flow limit. And within that, fuel flow is limited to 100 kilograms per hour. And this is where the idea of using oil as fuel was born. Because when you're limited to a certain amount of fuel flow, that limits the amount of power you can make. You have to have air and fuel to make power. But if I can add more fuel and get around the fuel flow sensor by burning oil, I can make more power. And this was successfully done between 2014, 2020. The peak of this was probably around 2017, 2018, when you know some cars looked like two cycles going down the straightaway with the amount of smoke coming out because of the amount of oil they were burning as fuel. I really wish I could tell you everything I know about this. However, I have secrecy agreements with some of our clients and people I've worked with in the past, but I can share this story that actually changed how I formulate motor oils. Several years ago, at the very beginning of this turbo hybrid era, I met a gentleman named Bruce Crawley, who worked for ExxonMobil and was in charge of their Formula One fuels and oil development program. We had a wonderful dinner one night at the World Motorsport Symposium, and he shared a thought with me that stuck. He said, you know, Lake, I've been following your career, and I know that you've done a lot of great work with the guys at Lubrizol, done some great things with those guys for Joe Gibbs Racing. However, both Afton and Lubrizol only approach things from an additive perspective because they're additive companies. And at ExxonMobil, we make base oils and additives through their Infinium subsidiary. So we look at things a little bit different. He said, some problems aren't best solved by an additive. Sometimes they're best solved with a base oil. And I took that to heart. In fact, when I saw Bruce the next year at the same conference, I mentioned to him that I had approached a problem that we had encountered during the year. And as opposed to looking at the additive first, I went the base oil route first we were actually able to make a better product that actually contained fewer components and less additives by building from the base oil first. And that same lesson still holds true today. Sometimes the answer is an additive. Other times the answer is base oil. To burn that much oil, to make power that's not regular motor oil that you're using. So let's dive into the details about how that oil was so different than even regular racing oil to be able to provide power. Understand how you can use oil as fuel, you first need to understand a little bit about fuel. The term octane is commonly known when it comes to fuel. Well, here's the thing. Octane just means it's an eight carbon long molecule. So fuel is a hydrocarbon. It's hydrogen 
and carbon atoms stuck together. And there's eight carbon atoms within the molecule. That's what makes it octane. Uh, oddly enough, octane by itself is actually a very low octane fuel. Isooctane is actually a high octane fuel. If you want to know more about fuel, leave a comment below to let me know. We can dig deeper into the chemistry of fuels. But for now, just know that fuel is about an eight carbon long molecule that can be burned to make power. Now, some synthetic base oils like polyalpha olefins are derived from C10, which is called desine. It's a 10 carbon length molecule. So some very light polyalpha olefins are near C10 and actually contain some residual C10 in them. Because that oil molecule is pretty close to fuel with some clever engineering, it can be burned as fuel. Just as a side note, we actually did that when I worked at Joe Gibbs Racing. Daytona and Talladega are tracks where every last little bit of horsepower counted. So we used a really light polyalpha oven, PAO2, a two Cinestoke PAO. To give you some perspective on how thin PAO2 is, a 30 grade motor oil is about 10 Cinestokes. So we're talking about a fifth of the viscosity of a regular engine oil is what we were using as our base stock. Now that super light base oil helped us make more power, but it also increased oil consumption. We would burn almost a gallon of oil per race because of using that super light base oil, which helped increase horsepower. So you might be wondering, well, oil is in the crankcase. Combustion happens in the combustion chamber. How does the oil in the crankcase end up impacting combustion. Well, through some innovative engineering with piston rings, Formula One engineers were clever enough to find ways to get the right type of molecule structure in that motor oil into the combustion chamber so that it could be vaporized and burned to aid combustion. As I mentioned earlier, at the beginning of this turbo hybrid era, there wasn't a limit on how much oil could be consumed during a race. So some teams took full advantage of that and burned a lot of oil per race in order to make a lot more power. Now, over time, FIA clamped down on that. Today, that limit is 0.3 liters per 100 kilometers. When I first started regulated, it was 1.8 liters. So the amount of oil that's allowed to be consumed as fuel during the race is massively limited. But I wouldn't put it past the guys today to take full advantage of that 0.3 liters to make as much power as they can. Look at the grid, how close it is. You have teams within hundredths of a second of each other. So every little bit of power matters. So to take advantage of the power gain that can come from burning oil as fuel, that oil is very different chemically than your regular car oil is. Now we already mentioned the base oil, but there's more to it than just the base oil itself. Because when you have oil burning in the combustion chamber, it's going to lead to deposit. So one of the things that mark these oils is that many of the oils used in Formula One were based on ashless technology. That's right, these oils were closer to a two-stroke oil than they were your regular conventional passenger car engine oil or especially a diesel engine oil. No high levels of calcium here, my friend. No way. You don't want to have LSPI in a Formula One engine at 15,000 RPM and who knows how much boost they can make with that MGU-8. So the chemistry of the oil is very specific, not only in terms of the base oil blend, but also in terms of what additives or lack thereof are used to make the oil. And this is a great lesson because sometimes people think that, well, more is better. If a little bit of ZDP is good, more should be better. If a little MODTC, molybdenum, is good, more must be better. And we've cautioned about this in some of our other videos that 
Sometimes more isn't always better. And in this case is a perfect example of that. Very, very high levels of additives can actually lead to more deposit formation in some situations. Turbocharger bearings is a great example for that. The higher the ash containing content, typically the more deposits will form. Now that's not always the case, but these are generally true rules that higher level of additives tends to cause more deposits. And this is why two cycle oils contain almost no ash containing additives like molybdenum or ZDP or calcium, where a two cycle oil might have 100 parts per million or less of one of those additives. Most two cycle oils have none of those because that higher level of additive will lead to a higher level of deposits in a situation like a two cycle where obviously you are burning oil with the fuel. And that's what made that era of Formula One so interesting from a oil guy side of things because there was really interesting chemistry going in to those engines when they were burning that much oil per race and you were doing it to make big power. But you couldn't use ZDP. You couldn't use Molly in order to protect the parts. So how did they protect those parts when you only had base oil? And this is where the science of tribology came in to win the day. Because when you have advanced coatings like DLC on highly loaded parts, say like wrist pins, camshaft followers, and things like that, by utilizing surface finish engineering and advanced coatings, you eliminate the need or greatly reduce the need for the normal anti-wear additives because DLC is inert. You actually don't need ZDP with DLC. In fact, too much ZDP hurts DLC. So Formula One engines are really a case study in how tribology can be used in order to gain efficiency. Like we said, they're the most thermal efficient engines ever built. And part of me is kind of sad to see them go for 2026. Now it's still gonna be a V6, it's still gonna be a hybrid and still be turbocharged. But one of the exciting parts of the 2026 regulations is the move to a fully sustainable fuel. And as we've said before, fuel is the enemy of your oil. So it'll be really interesting to see what kind of technologies are developed for the oil to deal with the unintended consequences of this change in fuel. This fuel will be different and it will have different behavior than the previous generation of fuel. So the oil will have to meet the demands of this new fuel, which again, more fun with tribology and motor oil. So it will be interesting to see how all of this plays out. If I learn anything, I'll let you know. In the meantime, check out one of these and we'll see you next time.